together and all that. Oh, man. I mean, it was such a cool piece of film. And I love the fact that Dick Clark was the one that came in and, you know, to, I got the project out of the vaults some 20 years later, 30 years later, and then went through the process of getting everybody to re-sign contracts. Our contracts were all written for a year. And then at the end of the year, the, the contracts were no good because we thought it had a shelf life of a year. Nobody ever thought it would have a much longer shelf life. Yeah. And then he took it and redid all the contracts, got everybody's signatures. And then, you know, with all the new technology and the digital stuff, he cleaned up uh, the original stuff and made it really look great, made it sound great. Everybody's see them arriving, the greatest stars you'll ever see. Some are flying and some are driving from Liverpool to Tennessee. Chuck Berry's checking in from St. Louis. He's going to see Maybelline and Memphis, too. The representative from New York City is Leslie Ford. Now she sure looks pretty. Here they come. Here they come You know the guitar's proven So keep it moving And come on, come on, come on From all over the world Can't you just hear everybody sing it The biggest sound you've ever heard A clapping and a stomping While the guitar's screaming You better go spread the word don't forget the Motor City sounds of the day, the baby loving Supremes and Marvin Gaye, the king of the blues, so cool. James Brown, the Beach Boys singing now, I get around, you get around, Woo! I get around, here they come. theme song to the 1964 Tammy Awards program. Here they come from all over the world. A show emceed by Jan Barry and our guest, Dean Torrance. You mentioned the suits earlier, and I imagine they, executives at any company possibly, would be looking at the uh, Dead Man's Curve movie and wondering, you know, would this work? But those of us that are into music knew that this would work. <laughs> <laughs> and it did. Yeah. This, this thing was huge for you guys. Oh, it's huge. And it, yeah, right. It did get turned down, but, you know, the Beatles got turned down. Sure. So you get used to that, and then you just hope that you have the luck that you're going to run into that one person out of 10 or one person out of 20 or one person even out of 100 that goes, that sees it. Yeah. And gets it. And exactly the way that you got it. I, I was very involved in Steve Martin's career early on. And for, God, we toiled for God, at least five to seven years trying to get anybody to listen, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We, uh, my, my friend Bill and, and I knew he was a genius. And yet you record him, and so you have a demo, and then we even videotaped him, and we, we had everything. We'd go into these meetings, and these people would look at this and never even crack a smile and <laughs> fast forward it and hand it back to us and say, thank you, we'll call you, and don't call us. 
Yeah, that's and you right. Go, and after a while, you just go, are we crazy? Yeah. Are we the only one? And yeah. you just learn as a creative person. You take a deep breath. You go, okay, we'll hang on to it. Maybe we tweak it some and we make our presentation a little bit sharper. And then we wait for the next round people because people get fired. And six months from now, you can go back to all those television stations or radio stations or record companies. And there are a lot of new people. Yeah. And we may get lucky. We find somebody. We can't be the only ones in the world that think Steve Martin is funny. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you question yourself, swear to God. I borrowed money on my house in, in the 70s to produce a, uh, put together a video package of, of Steve Martin and a proposed television show we wanted to do with him. And it got turned down at all the networks. There was only three major networks and Fox was just coming. Thing. And uh, nobody wanted it. We walked out of our last meeting and just kind of went, how the hell am I going to get my money back? And I was making big payments on the money I borrowed against my house. Luckily, my parents bailed me out and told me never to do that again. <laughs> Please don't, don't, you know, do things like this. Yeah. And then two years later, he, he's the biggest thing in, in the world. And I kind of went, Mom and Dad, you see? Yeah, exactly. Then, then they were kind of, oh, they understood. Oh, okay, well, you were just too early in the game. And had I stuck it out, I would have been retired in Hawaii for the last 20 years, like my friend Bill, who was stuck with it. Yeah. But I got to design, design his album covers, and I made some money there. And, you know, been friends with Steve ever since. What you uh, very successful with Kitty Hawk uh, graphics um, did over what 150 covers, uh, won a Grammy award, which hopefully you've forgiven your daughters for breaking accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh that's right. Did I put that in the book? You did. <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> uh, but I still I, don't have a Grammy. It, it's gone. Yeah, a, a friend of mine really liked it because it was all duct tape and. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I gave it away, always thinking I was going to get another one, and I just never did. Yeah. I don't know. Well, what? they wanted to charge me, and I said, you know, I'm, well, I charge me. I'm, I won a Grammy. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to buy my own Grammy. No, no. Hi, this is Dean Torrance, and you're listening to Catching a Wave with Jammin' James Riley.
That's the tune Like a Summer Rains from the album Save for a Rainy Day, attributed to Jan and Dean, but pretty much all Dean Torrance, as Jan was trying to recover from that horrific car wreck. Dean's book, Surf City, The Jan and Dean Story, is a recent release on Select Books. We're talking with Dean about several moments of the group's career. One of the covers you did was uh, Michael Nesmith, who, in the Monkees, and, and I didn't realize, um, it just didn't dawn on me that the TV pilot you guys were doing was kind of opposite of uh, the Monkees on another network. And, and as you explained, Jane and Dean already had some hits, and who knows what would have happened. But you, you sensed it. Who a, knows? But <laughs> if their show worked, ours was similar. Yeah. If not a little bit better, quality. And, but then the two of them debuting the, in the same year would have been great for both of us. Oh, yeah. It would have been absolutely wonderful. And we were already kind of talking back and forth with some of their management people who were kind of connected to us, too, as well, through Screen Gems, because we, you know, we were owned partially by Screen Gems Music Publishing. Um, there was already some talk about them being on our show, doing cameos, and we'd do cameos on their show. So we would have the same relationship with them that we had with the Beach Boys. Oh, yeah. And, and it would have worked, again, would have worked really, really well for both parties. And uh, it didn't ever happen. Yeah. In that life. It is. Who knows? But it's interesting to think about where it would have gone. Sure. It's I watched that recently on, on YouTube, um, actually just this morning. Put it on, watched it again, and it's like, yeah, there were some you know, <laughs> there were some interesting moments of this. There's some funny stuff in yeah, here. There, there were a few. Yeah. You know, we had to do it by the book because it was a pilot. Yeah. So it hadn't been sold yet, and we kind of had to do what the industry guys told us to do. We got our way... A few times, but uh, most time we were doing what they thought was, you know, what was proper. But our idea was kind of way different, and it would have evolved because once it was sold, then we would just say, uh, "Okay, here's what we want," and we're portraying ourselves. By the way, yeah, that's what I kept telling some of these directors. They'd go, "Well, we want you to do this and this and this." I go, um, "Who are we playing? <laughs> Who are we supposed to be?" Be portraying sure Jan and Dean Jan and Dean uh, well I'm Dean yeah <laughs> exactly and, and that's Jan and this is the way we want to do it because this is the way we've been doing it for seven years and it's worked yeah so there now once it was sold we would be we would have a lot more uh, leverage and we would have just said this is what we want or we quit it didn't matter to us yeah I even put that in the book I think we didn't really need that television show and so they would have had no leverage at all and they would have either agreed or or canceled the show i guess you sensed a relief that it wasn't picked up well it was picked up actually yeah but it, but then it went away because jan was sure. in the hospital yeah so it actually did get sold in the book i, I we had relief knowing that the, both of us didn't really care and if it didn't get picked up yeah, you know, there was no sweat. We didn't really care about it, and we hadn't seen the monkey shows. So we didn't know what their show was like, and it was kind of kind of like ours. Yeah, so it would have worked. Oh, sure, absolutely. Hey, hey, we're the monkeys, and people say we monkey around, but we're too busy singing to put anybody down. Stay tuned for more with Dean Torrance right after this. Gears and Gals magazine began with a simple goal to put out the Hot Rod magazine they wanted to read. Gears and Gals Hot Rod and Pinup magazine features exactly what you would expect. Pinup girls, artist profiles, events coverage, builder profile, and of course traditional and custom hot rod. It's also printed in the USA on the best quality paper and inks available. Find them online at gearsandgals.com. Gears and Gals magazine, the only hot rod and pinup magazine you'll ever need. This is Jam and James Ryan and you're tuned to Catching a Wave, where it's summer all year long. You're here in part two of our interview with Dean Torrance of Jan and Dean. In 1983, Dean collaborated with the Beach Boys' Mike Love for a string of concerts under the Mike and Dean moniker, which included a blitz of TV and radio interviews, as well as some recordings they released with some friends contributing tunes as well, from the likes of Bruce and Terry, the Ripcords, the Association, 